Studio now are Anzete Were, a development economist with a special interest in cultural and social issues, and Ingmen Han Liu, a Chinese national who has been in Kenya for the last 11 years and runs an NGO that reaches out to youth in the slums through educational uh, initiatives. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, let me start with you, Liu, because it's not often that we have Chinese nationals in studio on a local station. We were just talking about this during the break. Uh -huh. But what had you? stay in Kenya when you first came? Uh, first, I should ask, what had you come to Kenya first? Okay, so um, as you can see, I'm not very old. Okay. So my mom brought me here okay. when she was working here. So I had my high school and university here in Nairobi. And after that, I started doing uh, my own NGO just here, focusing the youth empowerment pro uh, projects in Mathare and uh, Kibera. So you had the option of going back uh, home. You didn't have to stay. Why did you? Um, first, my mom is still here. Okay. She's still working. And uh, I've, I've been like 11 years here now, so I'm quite used to the local culture. And uh, I make a lot of friends around here. And I have my work. So I, I decided to stay here. Yeah. And what has your general experience been in terms of interacting with Kenyans? Are they accommodating? Have you found there's been maybe tension at times when interacting with Kenyans? Most of the times, especially in, in Mathare, mm -hmm. like uh, that's where my daily work is, um, people are really friendly. Yeah. And since I've been doing this for four years, like almost every, everyone in that region knows me. So when they see me around, they'll greet me, they say hi, and then they talk me with Luo. Now I re reply with them, uh, Luo, I say, <laughs> Ber? Yeah. Yeah, so something like that. So um, yeah, pretty much okay, and, and it's, it's, it's good. Uh, sometimes there are people questioning me about mm. the kind of like the tense issues. Yeah. But after the communication and like an understanding is made, like, it's what I think is there sometimes a lack of communication and understanding between each other. All right, and yeah. we'll get to that whole aspect of the race relations. I'll bring you in and Zetse on this because we've seen reports of oftentimes unfair treatment uh, of staff, SGR, uh, Kenyan staff by their Chinese counterparts, um, the viral videos that have gone on on social media. And you can understand the anger of Kenyans feeling like they've been slighted uh, in this agreement between the Kenyan and Chinese government. And so what are the uh, implications, social implications of ignoring the race aspect when it comes to trade partnerships and ties, for instance, between both governments? Well, I think more broadly speaking, scene African relations have been dominated by government-to-government government interactions. Yeah. And that's why often when you see racist behaviors by Chinese nationals, people start to link that to the Chinese government for some reason, which I think is rather absurd because mm -hmm. the Chinese government is very separate to how individuals choose to conduct themselves. Um, I think more broadly speaking, there are two implications if this conversation doesn't, uh, I think, uh, get the traction that's required and sort of the concerns of Africans being addressed. I think one, um, the whole soft power issue that China is really trying to push into Africa where they're trying to get influence, geopolitical, cultural, um, even ideological influence. Now we're seeing sort of, sort of Xi Jinping's stepping up almost as an ideological leader of multilateralism and open trade and, and multiculturalism. And that's really a new part of the, sort of the Chinese government push. Um, and of course, race relations uh, will affect the receptivity mm. to that. I think the, the second part, it will just, accept, it will just um, affect Africans' perceptions of Chinese nationals. I think there hasn't been much cultural interaction uh, between Kenyan nationals and Chinese nationals out of sort of constructed government mm you know, events where there's a cultural exchange by the embassy or, you know, there's, there's something that's quite government to government. Um, and I think this is really a time for that conversation to start uh, because I think it's very immature and uh, not immature in terms of childish, but just young. Um, and it's just, it's just the reality that as we go forward, this will be a conversation that we have to have. And beyond efforts by both governments to foster these engagements, it often is a lot heavier from the Chinese side. Yeah. Um, and the understanding, at least from African countries when interacting with China, is we're coming together as equals. We're not looking for a handout. But oftentimes you find 
maybe because the funds are coming from China, that the cultural exchange is heavier from the Chinese side. What does this mean for Kenya, for, for Africa? Well, I just think, I mean, quite frankly, if, if, if one country has a stronger geopolitical strategy and is willing to put more money behind it to share its culture and understanding, then they have the right to do that. I think the question should be, why don't African countries have the same attitude? Mm. Why don't we have those programs in China? Why aren't we trying to teach the Chinese Kiswahili? So I think we cannot fault the Chinese for trying to say this is part of our culture. I mean, Europe and North America do it all the time, from Hollywood to everything. Um, you see their culture and their values, all of that, as, 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 as just a part of, of, of who they are as a people uh, in the world. And I think the Chinese are well within their rights. I think what happens is confusing um, that sort of um, interest in sharing Chinese culture for trying to dominate African people. Okay. And I think when you now sort of layer on this sort of racism that's, that's really beginning to emerge, which is a natural evolution, I think, mm -hmm. as relationships become more complex and also as relationship becomes less, um, less controlled. Because if you remember, the dominant um, engagement with Africa has been government. It has been a very controlled interaction and very measured. But as the economic ties have grown, we see independence, uh, Chinese private sector coming in as individuals uh, to make money on the continent. Some of them are racist, some of them are not. Right. And so there's no longer this control that used to sort of you know, inform the Chinese thrust into Africa. And I think that's where we're beginning to see these complexities uh, come out now. And Lou, just to get your take on this, you grew up in China. What is the general perception uh, Chinese have of Africa, of, of Africans, beyond what we've seen, there was the, the Lunar New Year Gala, I believe, and there was a Chinese woman in blackface. And a lot of people were so offended by that show um, of blackness or Africanness, if you will, and wondering, is this what Chinese people think of Africans? Okay, um, in my perspective or uh, in my communication with my uh, fellows, yeah. um, uh, the first thing they felt is maybe Africa is hot everywhere. Um, but I think this is based on they know the Sahara Desert mm. and they were not very clear with how big uh, Africa is because a Africa is really big. They never knew that um, uh, uh, south of the Sahara Desert we have uh, uh, East Africa, we have South Africa. The, the, the climates are pretty good. Like when, when I'm sending photos or, uh, or, 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 or tweets on, on, on the social media, then they say that, wow, Kenya is that beautiful. I want to come next year. I'll plan for that. So actually, um, that's what I think about the, uh, the perception here. And many would yeah. ask, is a lot of the race tensions we're seeing now being motivated by ignorance? Like you're saying, most don't really understand Africa. Or is it the thought that most Chinese feel that Africans are inferior? Where, where is it coming from? Um, I don't think there is that attitude of inferior, especially mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in China. Um, they are pretty much like, um, it's just that there's no channel for them to understand more about Africa. So, and actually this is also something that I was thinking with my friends living in Kenya, that we wanted to have kind of like maybe a YouTube channel or something, uh, or Facebook, to, to, to let the world know more about how real uh, Chinese are doing in Africa or how a real Chinese is, is, is behaving <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the society. So yeah, that's what uh, actually we're planning to do. And then let's say from, from the Kenyan side, when we do see a lot of these reports coming out uh, from China, the reactions to Black Panther movie and uh, what they said in terms of the portrayal of black privilege on the big screen was a bit off-putting to the Chinese audience. And when you see those kinds of comments coming out, um, what's your take on that when it comes to race relations here? I think a couple of things. I think as, as, as the gentleman has alluded to, I think there hasn't been a lot of racial interactions between Chinese nationals and African nationals. And, as, and I, from my view as a Kenyan, as a black African, mm. I think there's a lot of ignorance there. Now, don't get me wrong, from an African perspective, whether the racism is informed by sort of backwardness or ignorance, it still feels as racism, and so we feel quite violated by that. Um, so I think the, the, the issue that we're having, I think, as African people is that we know that, that Chinese nationals have also faced racism from other, from other parts yeah. of the world. So I think as people of color, we were expecting, you know, perhaps th this shouldn't be happening because you've been stereotyped before, um, you've been actually uh, persecuted 
partly because of the color of your skin. We've gone through the same thing. And so getting that from other people of color, I think is something that black Africans find particularly disappointing. That's not to say that it's uncommon. We've had racial tensions here in Kenya when you know a certain supermarket that's owned by a certain race was seen mm. to say racist things. We've had obviously European and North Americans nationals uh, being put to question as to some of the racist comments that they make. So I think part of what's happening is that we're beginning to understand that there shouldn't be any exceptionalism, that anti-black racism is probably common all, along, all around the world. And I think that's just part of the historical baggage that we're having to deal with as Africans in particular. And I think one of, the, one of the things I think that makes Kenyans particularly frustrated is when you come home to Kenya and face it. And I don't, it, I don't think we care whether it's from a Chinese national or someone from Britain or, or someone from the US or a Mexican or an Indian. When you're in our country, that is completely intolerable. Because when we go outside, we're going to face that anyway. I've lived in many countries. I'm sure you've traveled to many yeah. countries. And dealing with that outside is one thing. But when you're home, you don't want to feel like you have to negotiate your humanity when you're at home. So I think that's why people get particularly angry um, when these racist incidents happen on like African and Kenyan soil. Right. Yeah. Uh, and Lou, how would you want to change those negative perceptions uh, that Nzete has just talked about that Kenyans have of being slighted, of being disrespected, you know, on their home turf beyond perhaps a YouTube channel to open up uh, other Chinese nationals' minds? What else would you want to do? Um, yeah, just as uh, I say, it is uh, one is to build a channel of actually the world reaches Africa, no more, and uh, to know what is the real uh, real thing happening, and um, actually um, uh, things are going slowly by slowly, and people are getting know more about um, uh, how how uh, how to do. Uh, for example, like uh, in in my organization. Um, when, when we start doing projects in the beginning, um, we, we do get funds from China, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the majority funds. But now, slowly by slowly, we also get supported by the local uh, Chinese entrepreneurs. And they're also willing to, not only to support by giving money, they also want to be involved again and, and, and support us with the projects. And, you know, and Zetse, I think the thing that will be the uniting aspect is allowing that chance to come to a table like this, where you can have equality and mutual respect for each other, that it's not one culture trying to take over another, but we truly understand each other. How do we get there? And, and I'm sure social media has helped in fueling a lot of these negative sentiments uh, each side will have to each other but in the age of social media how do we correct that i think that's very difficult to correct and i don't think that's necessarily possible because quite frankly if you look at the anti-black sentiments from other races this has been going on for centuries and it's still nothing has changed i think it's really up to individuals to decide what they're going to believe what they're not going to believe and of course you as a black african have a right to make it very clear yeah. that certain behaviors is simply not acceptable and you're not going to tolerate it but i think it would be a bit utopian and to assume that we can have, you know, be beautiful relationships with one race when we've had certain relationships with another race and we're still being discriminated against, we're still, you know, being, um, being sidelined. So I think it would be a bit utopian to think, oh, you know, to be different with China. I think the reality is that individuals are individuals. They're allowed to make up the minds. They're allowed to choose what to believe. And we as black people need to make sure that we, are, we communicate, that we demand to be respected and at least have a conversation without... Um, stereotyping us and having us defend who we are as humans. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think we should think that there's some utopia that we can get with China that we haven't managed with just about every other race. So I think we need to be a bit realistic there. And Leo, from a lot of the comments I'm seeing here on social media, the fear that most Kenyans have is China has come to take over. Uh, it's not a partnership. It's not a negotiation. How do you respond to those sentiments? Um, no, um, according, I, I did a little bit of study on the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Um, it's um, it's a, a very big, important, or a very big aspect uh, the Belt and Road mentioned was people-to-people -people bonding. So I believe everything new comes to the, to the, to, to the society has a lot of... Um, a lot of problems. Even when we do business, in, uh, no, when we do projects in Mathare, when we have a new uh, idea coming, there's also always a lot of resistance, a lot of, a, a lot of not understanding. So I believe that um, if we're able to open our mind 
and have the mutual understanding both on our side and the the, the uh, and Kenya, so that we can have a, a better understanding between each other, so that we can um, you know the things will be sorted. You yeah. know, some could argue and let's say that when we owe China over half a trillion shillings in debt. Um, do we really have a say when it comes to this cultural exchange? You mentioned, you know, why don't we have uh, institutions in China teaching Chinese Swahili, for instance, or just other aspects of Kenyan culture or African culture for that matter. Some could argue, well, you're the ones doing the paying back. Do you really have a say when it comes to this exchange? Yes, I mean, let us not. One of the things I find very frustrating in the attitude we have as Kenyans towards the Chinese relationship is that we're acting as though we didn't know what we we're getting into. Mm. Um, I'm already seeing references, oh, the Chinese are here to colonize us, they're here to control our resources. And I think we need to be very careful as to what we're actually talking about here. When you look at the relationship between China and Africa, it is African governments that willingly enter these, re these relationships. Nobody is pushing debt onto Kenya. Nobody is pushing debt onto Africa. African governments, the Kenyan government included, has demonstrated appetite for debt, the Chinese are a willing creditor, and so the, the government will take that money. Bear in mind that when we look at the actual debt that we owe China, we owe the World Bank even more. Mm. Okay, So I think one of the things we need to be aware of, particularly as Africans, is that there's been a very heavy anti-Chinese narrative that's been pushed particularly out of Europe and North America, and it's working. And the whole narrative is that, oh, the Chinese are there to exploit you, they're there to steal your continent, you know, they're there to colonize you. And this is being done in a context where African governments are willingly making these agreements. So if we're upset with you know, African relations mm. or if we feel you know, things are imbalanced, can we bring those questions to our governments? Let us not start blaming Chinese individuals or the Chinese government because all these interactions, all this debt that we've been getting into is because of the agency of African governments. And I think we're really getting into a trap as Kenyans, and I've seen it a lot on Twitter, where we're acting as though the Chinese are here to do and to do that, to do this. Our governments have agency, our governments have decision-making capacity, and our governments are the ones that willingly enter these agreements. Let us not act as though these are things that have been pushed onto our governments, right? So I think we need to be very careful because what is happening is that we're actually infantilizing ourselves. We are saying that we are not able to deal with the power that is China. You know, we're not able to have agency in that relationship. When the reality is that we do have the right. If we're making bad deals, that's on us. Mm. You know, it is not China's job to take care of Kenya. It is our government's job to take care of our people. So if we do have concerns, which is fair, I mean, if there are concerns that we have as a people, let us raise that with our governments rather than demonizing uh, uh, an entity that our governments willingly um, engage with. So I think we need to be very careful because we don't want to start infantilizing ourselves and acting as though, oh, you know, this is all happening and, you know, we, we have no agency in all of this. It's, it's really quite sad, you know, and I think that we need to just take responsibility and ownership because only when we do that can we change. If we have problems and we have agency, then we can change it. So I think we need to think about that as Africans. And you know, Liu, when you saw a lot of those viral videos, uh, the one of the Chinese national insulting Kenyans and, and the president, um, or the contractors in Uganda who are costing a minister, of course, a lot of people are getting very upset. What do you tell Kenyans, what do you tell Africans when it comes to the agenda for Chinese, not the Chinese government, you now as a Chinese national, as an individual, what's the agenda? Um, I, I saw the video and uh, I'm very angry too because, uh, you know, everywhere there is a, a wrong person or a wrong thing happening. So I, I would like to tell uh, the Kenyans that he's, he's not us. Like, we, um, we're also very angry about it. We, we're happy to see him out of this country. So um, uh, regarding to this, I, I want uh, I want people to understand like uh, like not everyone is the same. Like for example, uh, a lot of people ask me, do all Chinese eat snakes, <laughs> or do do do, do all Chinese taste. eat uh, eat 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 dogs? I say, I've never tasted those things. So not because I stay here for eleven years, I always go back to China and visit my father. He's there. So um, it's it's just stereotypes, and I would like. Uh, 
people to open their mind and maybe understand deeper. Uh, which I'll put to you, and Zetsa, and you talked about this, taking responsibility and, and trying to learn the other side, even though we have a huge wave and influx of information and media coming from the Chinese side, even still, Kenyans can be quite ignorant of Chinese culture. So how do we improve that in terms of really understanding? Well, actually, I think side. one of the problems that we don't have information, I think, I think one of the problems that we're having as, as, as Africans and as a Kenyan, and as, as someone who studies the China-Africa space, is that actually a lot of the content that we consume on China actually comes out of Western media, okay? So you find that there's a lot of analytics on China-Africa relations, but not much of it is coming out of China. And part of that is a language problem, which mm. I think is, a, is just a fundamental problem, and I don't know how we're going to solve that beyond you know, the Chinese learning our language and us learning Mandarin. Um, so I think one of the things we need to remember is that a lot of the content we consume on China doesn't come out of China. It comes usually out of Western media. And one of the things that I've seen very clearly is that Western media have a certain agenda when it comes to how they paint the Chinese agenda and Sino-African relations. So I think we as Africans need to be, be be a very sober in what they're doing. If a Chinese national is racist, absolutely, that's completely unacceptable, yep. and we're not going to tolerate that. Right. But also, let us not become a pawn in another game. Let us not start getting, blaming people before something has happened. You know, let us hold people accountable for what they're doing, and above all, let us hold ourselves accountable for what we are doing. You know, so I think we need to be a bit more sober and mature in what we're doing, um, and and really realize that we have the agency to change this relationship if we want to as a people. And the reason why I say that is because. Um, I'm almost beginning to feel a sense of helplessness in, in Africans mm -hmm. um, that, oh, the Chinese are here. What are we going to do? You know, they're taking over everything. When really we do have the power because it is our governments that are getting into these, these interactions. So right. let us stay focused. I and mean, let us also appreciate that these unpleasant things are part of relationships. So I'm not suggesting we tolerate mm -hmm. them, yeah. but I'm just saying these things happen. And we must, you know, um, be very clear as to how we expect to be treated. Okay. And as we wrap up, Leo, I'll give you the last word. Okay, um, um, regarding to, uh, b because just uh, where it has also mentioned yeah. about the, um, uh, the language barrier, I, I think on our side, uh, especially the workers, uh, the Chinese workers here, they, they should be more uh, advanced with language so that they are willing to communicate with, with Kenyans and understand deeper. You know, sometimes they are not good with the language, yeah. so they are scared to talk with other people. So I think if they, they try and just talk whatever he wants, and communicate uh, uh, with, with Kenyans, then there will be a great change uh, in that. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Liu and Nzetse, for your insights. Of course, this is a conversation that needs to continue at tables much like this on social media so we get a better understanding on where each side is coming from. That does it for Citizen Weekend. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again tomorrow night with Jeff Koinange. You don't want to miss that. Good night.